Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spiritual Realms and Charismatic Cults. My name is Oscar Reveling, Education Manager at the Wilsonian FIU. We're pleased to have you join us today for Promises to be a, a very mystical evening. Uh, today is, is a curious day, one that signals the start of a new season. Today is marked by the Hunter Moon, the full moon this month, and the one closest to the fall equinox. As such, it marks a special moment and traditionally was a time for us to venture out, to go forth and begin gathering the supplies, the nourishment that we need to prepare for the winter ahead. And so we thought it'd be the perfect moment to, to arrange this sort of conversation and unique exploration of our collection. I'm joined by two esteemed colleagues, Wilsonian creator Shoshana Reznikov and digital assets manager Isabel Bredor Sands who will act as our mediums in this virtual journey, tapping into the uncanny side of our collection. We'll hear more about the curious stories uh, behind items that evoke a certain paranormal phenomena, along with others, uh, including the spiritual leaders, perhaps charlatans behind um, tapping into these stories, but also um, perhaps under questionable means. Throughout our program, we encourage you to share remarks via our chat feature down below. And if there are any questions you'd like for us to address at the end of the presentation, please direct those in our Q&A feature down below as well. With that, Shoshana, Isabel, please come on screen and take us away. Thanks, Oscar. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Like Oscar mentioned, I'm Isabel Bredor Sands. I am the digital asset and collection manager here at the Wolfsonian, and I am absolutely thrilled to be able to share this part of the evening with you, especially on such a um, auspicious and new beginning day. Um, I'm especially thrilled to be sharing this with Shoshana. Her and I have a soft spot, um, not only for our collection, but particularly for everything that is weird and wacky, um, supernatural, and occult. So our first part of this discussion this evening will focus more on the spiritual realms aspect. And a quick note about the format, we'll actually be focusing on discrete uh, subsections of our collection and different themes. Um, they may not inherently connect, um, but we're hoping throughout the course of this hour that it'll become clear um, the overlying and overarching themes that do in fact connect these. Um, and we're more than happy that, uh, to continue discussing these in the Q&A as well. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And we're going to start this, oops, hold on. Oh, there we go. So we're going to start with literature. Um, so for the uninitiated, we have about 80,000 volumes in our object collection um, that form part of our library. And there is a wide range of literature, but particularly that pertaining to the supernatural. And it runs the gamut from everything from um, the tried and true stories, um, which you may have already recognized in that left-hand image here of Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, um, to something that we might recognize more as more commercially modern day Halloween, right? So we've got stories of ghouls and goblins, dragons and, and witches. Um, and then there's a small subsection um, that also kind of uh, veers on the edge of creepy, um, unsettling, and dark. Uh, so we'll explore a little bit about those, starting with the tried and true tales and mythologies that have been passed down for, uh, for generations. So the first one, again, is Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. This particular edition was printed in 1934. Um, the text is the original by uh, Mary Wollstone uh, Shelley, but uh, the illustrations are by Lind Ward, and we'll see a little bit more of his work uh, in the subsequent slides. But a bit of background on Frankenstein. So it was first published in 1818, um, and the uh, start of the story was really a competition to, as to who could tell the scariest story between Mary Shelley, um, her then lover, soon to be husband, uh, Percy Shelley, and a few guests while they were vacationing in uh, the countryside in Switzerland. Um, no one really gave uh, Mary any thought that she would come up with the scariest story, um, but she did. And that's when Frankenstein, um, Frankenstein was born. Uh, it was then published in 1818 anonymously. And Mary wasn't uh, identified as the author until the second printing in 1821 in Paris. Um, and it became an international sensation, a bestseller. Since then, there's actually close to 300 editions of the book that's been that have been printed um, 
in numerous languages in numerous countries. And even though Frankenstein is considered the um, progenitor or one of the first or earliest versions of a uh, science fiction novel in that genre, it's um, actually he, the creature is actually one of the most iconic horror uh, monsters known to our time, um, probably only second to Bram Stoker's um, Dracula. So what's really interesting about this telling is you'll notice that in 19, this 1934 edition um, was printed uh, about almost uh, over 100 years after the original, right? Um, and this tells the this speaks to the power of retellings. Um, there's actually a blog post on our institutional blog about this. Um, and Shoshana, while we were editing that blog post and, and putting it together, um, she made a really good point that the power in retellings not only lay in the fact that these stories are being passed on and um, being introduced to new generations, but that it's emerging of talents. Um, so here on the right, we have Mary Shelley, the original author, 1840. Um, this is actually in the National Portrait Gallery. And this next slide really delves into the 1934 uh, illustrations. So here on the left, we have the monster or the creature, depending on how you want to refer to him. Creature sounds a little more sympathetic to his plight, um, defending himself from villagers. And Lynn Ward uh, was a prolific illustrator. Uh, he actually is credited with illustrating over 100 different volumes, many of them children's. Uh, children's novels. Um, but here you can see that this is like a really graphic and powerful um, movement. So he's actually captured what uh, Shelley describes as the grotesque beauty of the uh, monster. So his creator, Dr. Frankenstein, wanted to make him attractive, chose luscious locks, uh, rippling muscles. But in fact, when he put all these things together, um, was repulsed rather than, than proud of his creation. You can see that there in the left, these strong muscles um, you'll see it in the top and bottom images here on the right. Uh, Lynn Ward is actually credited with being uh, the father to the modern day graphic novel. Um, and these prints are really evocative of the power of storytelling and his ability to tell a story in just um, a few, a few uh, prints. And one of my particular favorites is Dr. Frankenstein here brooding at his laboratory. And you see all of the beakers and the vials um, and you can just tell in, in the anticipation of what's to come. Uh, so Ward, again, he was uh, extremely busy with over 100 different publications, and these are also in our collection. Um, it's an almanac for moderns. It was printed in 1935, so a year after the Frankenstein printing. Um, and you'll see that this also has a mystical theme. It has to do with cosmology, astrology in particular. Um, and a fun fact, Shoshana is actually a Pisces, I'm an Aries, and then Gemini was just an illustration that I really liked from the almanac. But uh, there are similar influences here at work. So uh, very simple, very stylized, but also really powerful, really evocative of the scene. Um, and just another example of how Lindward was able to tell a narrative um, without using any words. So another volume that we can look at, and it falls under the category of being uh, a mythology that we're all really uh, familiar with, is The Fall of the House of Usher uh, by Edgar Allan Poe. Here on the left is a photo that was taken about nine years before Poe's un, uh, unexpected demise. Um, he lived a short life, only about 40 years. And uh, Poe is known for having these influences that are really um, prevalent in the spiritual realm, right? So we have ideas of reanimation that's, hap re that's happening um, from Shelley being carried over. We have um, reincarnation. We have pseudosciences also being in effect. And um, if anyone's familiar with Poe's work, you know that there's always this theme that what is presumed to be dead does never really ever stays dead, right? Um, and it's no different with the fall of the House of Usher. Um, these particular uh, edition was printed in 1930. Um, Alexandria Alexiev is the illustrator, and uh, we'll actually come to the next slide so you can see a little more of the different illustrations. So these are actually um, aqua tints. Alexandria Alexiev is uh, the uh, inventor of pinpoint animation. And what's really interesting is you're able to see that fuzzy quality that lets you layer the image. Um, so here on the left, we have, um, if anyone's familiar with the fall of the House of Usher, you know that the unnamed narrator comes into the story and he comes upon the House of Usher. And the first thing he notices is this gaping crack in the foundation of the building. And you'll notice that here on the left, um, you'll notice that there's a crack in the middle 
there is the, the house. And then behind it, there are these windows. And the windows are important because in the very first few pages, um, as the narrator is describing you know, his journey and his um, uh, first sight of the house, he consistently mentions the windows and how they're like eyeless or soulless eyes. Um, and you'll see that echoed here behind. So the house seems to become larger than it is itself and hang out in the background. Um, you'll also see this in the middle. Um, the Fall of the House of Usher is really interesting because it has a story within a story, which is what um, introduces the climactic moment uh, for the uninitiated. The uh, narrator goes to visit a friend whose sister is ailing and they accidentally bury uh, the sister alive, presuming she's dead after she's had a fit. Um, and as he's telling a story, uh, the sister emerges from the tomb and he's telling the story that's here in the middle of ghostly fi figures and it actually kills uh, the narrator's friend. Uh, the narrator panics, runs out of the room, um, and when he runs out of the room and out of the house, the house of Usher actually collapses in on itself, which is the last image you'll see here. Um, and you can see it reflected in the lake. So you have these themes of not only death, uh, reanimation, also the ramifications of what would happen if supernatural phenomenon were to kind of run the uh, run amok. Next one. So uh, interestingly, oops, okay, here we go. I skipped one. So then we have, we are moving from mythology, um, tried and true stories over to what we might consider um, commercialized more of your bread and butter Halloween stories. So these are from our collection. Um, Ballads Weird and Wonderful, published circa 1912. These particular images are actually courtesy of the Ohio State University through the Google Books Project. While we do have this volume in our collection, it's not yet digitized. So we were able to access these um, using Google Books, a wonderful boon to technology, something I'm very proud of um, being in the digital realm. So here on the left, um, this print is really interesting. It's the typical story of uh, a maiden transformed into a creature. Um, you'll notice that she has this fantastical uh, serpent's tail. She's grotesque, she's hideous. Um, the text actually refers to her as having really stringy, scraggly long hair. Um, and horrible breath, which is, you can see here as being projected downward. She's got fangs. Um, and she's of course redeemed when she's uh, given a smooch uh, by a, a famous and wealthy prince. Um, here in the middle, you have um, the story of a traveler in the desert, a crusader actually. Um, he meets his doom, he meets his end. And then you have these um, wonderful birds, uh, probably carrion birds, more than likely crows looking over um, the assumption is that they've, you know, since picked him clean. Um, and then here we have a horrible uh, hag feature, a featured uh, person um, that's come in and she's uh, tricked and scaled and skinned uh, this uh, dragon. Um, this is the part of the story where she's uh, cleaning the dragon scale. Yes, Shoshana. I just want to note that uh, I don't love the gender politics of this book. <laughs> Right? Yeah. So, um, and that's actually, I'm really glad you mentioned that because that's something I think that comes into play later on. Um, it'll come into play in the next thing I'm looking at, um, but also uh, in, in some of the uh, the reasoning for forming cults, right? Gender politics play a big role in things. Um, so for our next slide. So Vernon Hill is the illustrator um, for Ballads Weird and Wonderful. Richard Pierce Chope, the editor. There isn't much about him except for that he was a civil servant. Um, but Vernon Hill is a prolific illustrator and sculptor, um, and we actually have something else in our collection by him that's equally creepy. Um, it's The Husher to Sleep, and it is a painting. Um, you may have seen this before. It's been featured in a few other um, uh, exhibitions and installations, but the text that goes around it is really interesting, and I'll, if you'll indulge me, I'll read it really quickly. Um, this is a portrait of the husher to sleep. His treatment of the human soul freed of the physical body is the peaceful divine solution to the human love desire. When all endeavor, star clasping and wing fluttering seem to have gained no consolation or happiness for the love eager, then this husher to sleep takes the desireful one in his arms, undresses the soul of its human body, 
and lays the freed spirit to sleep in the tender embrace of his lips. So the little fire um, that you have on the Hutcher to sleep's lips is a human soul. Um, and it's a really poetic kind of interpretation of an encounter with a grim reaper, right? So rather than something that approaches you um, armed and ready to take you by, by force, um, this is something that lulls you into the, the, next, the next life or the next phase, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, pardon me, I'm having some problems with my mouse pad. There we go. Um, and then this is the last sort of um, type of imagery or, or book that we'll look at. So this is um, the Tableau de la Della, um, Tales from Beyond. Apologies to anyone who speaks French in our audience this evening. I clearly do not. Um, this was published circa 1927 by uh, Frédéric Boutet, and he is um, known as being one of the progenitors to the science fiction movement. Um, and and here you'll have more of this dark occulty um, tales. Um, Edward Gorge is the uh, illustrator. And what's really interesting is it's picking up on that theme of sexuality and gender politics, Shoshana as well. Um, here on the left, you have um, some magic and witchcraft at play. You've got a spell book that's being read to. Um, clearly it's the woman, you know, uh, bringing that the the male figure in on the dark arts um, her uh, chest is bare and there is magic happening in the background there's uh, probably what looks like a familiar in the foreground up here on the on the ledge there's smoke coming out of what looks like a cauldron and in the very uh, background behind the male figure you see that there's a demonic presence um, picking up and dialing up to 100, that theme of sexuality. Um, we have here what looks like um, a, a devilish orgy possibly happening. Um, there's all sorts of animals involved. Um, there are creatures flying in the air. And then at the end, there's that constant trope that we have of a human sacrifice, right, happening. Um, I mean, this is probably the extent of human sacrifice that we're covering this afternoon, so not to worry. Um, but again, you have here a member of the clergy, you've got some more nudity, and then you have someone being being laid bare. So all of these themes are in the air during our time period, um, which is 1850 to 1950. During this hundred years, we've captured a wide range of time, but um, the ideas are still being carried forth and are still moving forward. Um, the idea of what happens when we move on um, and how otherworldly forces are influencing the time of the living, but also guiding um, and almost dictating what happens when we do move on um, into that otherworldly realm, um, which a lot of people have very different opinions on. And I'm going to turn it over to Shoshana so she can tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, and thank you so much, Isabel, for that, uh, what we might call a literature review of uh, the spiritual realms contained within the Wilsonian collection. Um, Isabel is absolutely correct when she says that uh, we share uh, an interest in this material. Um, and I think that's because the 100 year period that our collection at the Wilsonian covers, 1850 to 1950, is really rife with this kind of um, uh, push and pull between sort of what we might think of as rational modern thought and the more occult, the more spiritual. And those things actually really exist in tension with each other in many ways. Um, and when Isabel and I started talking about this presentation, it became really clear to us that part of the reason there's such rich depth in the literature um, and in the sort of artistic expression through literature and through illustrations of these um, sorts of discussions of of spiritualism and occultism and the, you know the afterlife um, is because these were these were um, points of conversation and investigation in the period itself in in everyday life in the in our lived in lived people's lived experiences and so they manifest in literature because they're also manifesting uh, uh, in in, um, in in the lived world um, and so I want to talk a little bit about some of those forces that we can see within the object collection that really do relate more to um, the kind of writing that people were doing, the kind of thinking that people were doing around spirituality um, in this period. And uh, I also want to try to sort of connect them in places to, uh, to art and to decorative arts and to creative output, because there is this kind of really wonderful link. I do want to start out, though, by saying that um, uh, for, for this sort of research that Isabel and I were doing, you know, we do owe a debt of gratitude to Matthew Abbas, who is a former colleague of ours and a curator of an exhibition in, I believe, 2016 called uh, Pursuit of Abstraction. That was a project that he 
uh, partnered with uh, Jerry Wolfson, who is a supporter of the museum and also um, a family member in many ways to all of the Wolfsonians. She is our founder, uh, Mickey Wolfson's niece. And uh, she's an amazing collector of um, uh, abstract art, uh, art, as particularly art produced by women, but also with this sort of spiritual, you know, there's a real, there's a real through line of spirituality in, the, in these works. And so um, it was great to be able to mine their research for this project. And I wanna, I wanna be sure to thank them both. Um, we begin though, not with abstraction. Uh, uh, we begin with uh, this gentleman, uh, Eliphas Levy, uh, who, uh, pardon, pardon this familiar. Uh, <laughs> uh, Eliphas Levy uh, is, a, is a French uh, poet, writer, occultist. Um, he actually, uh, as a young man, considers uh, joining the priesthood, the Roman Catholic priesthood, and pursues it for some years uh, until he decides that it's not for him, and it's at that point that he turns to the occult. And so he's clearly a searcher. You know, we do think there is this through line um, between all kinds of spirituality, which is the search for answers. And so uh, that's certainly the journey he was on. But through this um, interest in the occult, he eventually declares himself um, uh, a master of magic um, and uh, a mystic who understands Kabbalah um, uh, and various sort of Eastern religions. He's very vague about what those religions are. We're going to see that throughout this, that there is um, a real uh, sort of alighting of various um, Eastern belief systems and faith systems um, uh, into this appropriated mishmash of, uh, of, of, of beliefs. Um, so uh, Elvis Levy writes um, a, a series, a two, two volume compendium uh, called The Doctrine and Ritual um, of Magic. And in that book, uh, this is one of many books he writes, um, but in that book, he, he includes this illustration of, um, of Baphomet, uh, who uh, is, is a, a manifestation of Satan, of the devil. And, and this is a very different sort of uh, iteration of the devil. It's not Lucifer as sort of the, the light bearer, the fallen angel. It is a, you know, he is a demonic force who brings evil into the world and, and, and darkness. And um, in the occult, you are tangling with those forces, right? And you are uh, trying to use them for your own, for your own purposes. And this is one of these early representations of this figure with the horn, um, the, the central part of his crown. I'm making gestures on my own head. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, the goat's head and then the, the wings. And um, this, this is a, a book that is, uh, that is incredibly popular in the middle of the, of the 19th century and certainly uh, Levy is um, uh, very popular in certain intellectual circles where people are both um, intrigued by a little, a little sort of dancing with these ideas. And it might seem weird to see a vase uh, next to these two images of kind of occult origin. But in fact, um, it's a great way to illustrate just how widespread these ideas were. On the right is a vase by Christopher Dresser, um, the great British artist and designer um, uh, who was known uh, for his incredible work in, in ceramics. Um, in England in, in the second half of the 19th century. And um, this is called the old bogeyman pattern. Uh, old bogey was a slang term for the devil for, for a demonic force. Um, and as we can see, oh, next slide, Isabel. I'm sorry, I forgot that you were driving. <laughs> um, as you can see, uh, there's a, he's taken that form of Baphomet and he's abstracted it. And so um, the, the, the horns and the headpiece have become a crown. Uh, the wings have become kind of more ornate, um, but there is still that same um, sort of uh, grotesque quality to it. And, um, uh, and, and uh, there's, there's that, that trident and a real, and a real, um, uh, sense of, of the, of the spirituality of it. So I just love that connection that, that it, it went from book of ritual magic to, you know, commercial days. Um, so, so these forces, these kind of interests in occult and spirituality are spreading throughout Europe, but they also manifest in the United States as well. Um, on the left is a, a lithograph after a daguerreotype of three sisters, um, uh, Margareta or Margaret, Catherine and Leah Fox. Um, and in 1849, um, these three sisters uh, claim to have an experience in their home where they hear spirits talking to them through rapping, something like this. 
if you could hear that. Um, and uh, uh, these, these spirits, they claim to be able to speak with them. They actually call their mother in when they have this experience and they, their mother doesn't believe them. And so they, they, do, they give her a uh, proof of it. They ask, they ask the spirits um, basically yes or no questions or you know, rap five times if this. Um, and the spirits respond again with all of this tapping and rapping. Um, and uh, what's important to know about these sisters is that they are living in um, Hydesville, New York, which is Western New York. And it is a region of the state that is commonly known as the burned over district. Um, and it's <laughs> burned over because uh, of, the, of the sheer number of religious revivals that take place in the 19th century in this region. This is where Mormonism uh, is born, where Joseph Smith has his revelation uh, about, about uh, the angel Moroni. Um, this is where camp revivals start. Um, uh, evangelical Christianity has roots in this, in this region. And so there's a, a huge kind of wellspring of a spiritual yearning in this, in this region and a sense on the part of the residents that, that anything is possible. Um, and that lends itself to an interest in, in, in the spirit wrappings. The sisters become incredibly popular. Um, they travel the country uh, doing, uh, giving uh, presentations where they show off uh, their ability to commune with the spirits. These spirits are deceased people. They are able to commune with them and ask them questions. They, um, they you know, if you are in the audience, you can, you can request, I'm sure it involves paying them some money to, to speak to a loved one. Um, and this is, uh, a, like a nationwide sensation. Um, uh, in the end, it all falls apart when I believe it is Margaret who um, recants publicly and says that it was all a fake. Um, Kate and Leah uh, refuse to acknowledge this and uh, the sisters are, are um, estranged until they die. Uh, but this is the sort of uh, milieu in which um, many, many spiritualists begin to sort of articulate a connection to the, to the spiritual world. And um, if we could go to the next slide, um, it is so popular that there are even um, uh, satires and parodies of it. This is sheet music called Spirit Wrappings. Um, music is by Walter Rossington. The lyricist is uh, Elwood Garrett, and it is basically mocking um, the, the Fox sisters and the spirit wrapping movement. But one thing that's really important to note in this is actually in the, um, so you can see, I should say that in the, in the frame um, on the sheet music, there is a small boy whose chair is tipped back. That's to make the wrapping noise of the, the sort of on the floor, um, and uh, but in and, and in the corner, in upper left corner, there is um, a, a, a black woman, an African American woman, who um, is very likely an enslaved woman, and uh, she is also making knocking noises. Um, and one thing that's really important to know about the spiritualist movement in the United States in the middle of the century is that um, these were often movements that were aligned with women's rights and with abolition. Um, many spirit, many early spiritualists in the United States were women, uh, in part because it was one of the few ways where that women could um, achieve any sort of national attention, could sort of speak with authority and be listened to. Um, and so uh, we see this really interesting uh, movement of of um, kind of radical women's rights organization and spiritualism and, and this idea of women as medium sort of on a parallel track. And so of course, in this mockery of spirit wrappings, there is also a mockery of uh, the cause of abolition. Um, and so those two things, because they are often united in the form of the, of the medium of the spiritualist, they are also united um, in, the, in the critique, uh, which is unfortunate. Next slide. So um, into this world comes basically a bomb, uh, the biggest spiritualist of them all, uh, Helena Blavatsky, um, uh, or Helena, sorry, Helena Blavatsky, also known as Madame Blavatsky. Um, she is Russian born, travels through the empire as a child. Basically everything else we know about her life is pretty, um, is, is, is filtered through her. And so it's, and she's not a reliable narrator of her own experiences because she is um, a very talented self-promoter along with being a, um, a self-professed medium and psychic. So uh, uh, everything else I'm taking with a grain of salt, but um, she claims to travel throughout Europe and Asia in the 1850s um, and to absorb the, um, the, uh, um, 
to the spiritual learnings of, of Asia and particularly of Tibet. She says she spends a, a great deal of time in Tibet and meditates. And in her process of learning and traveling, she develops a theory basically of the spiritual world. Um, she comes to the United States in 1875 and, and set, sort of sets up shop there. And her argument is that she, is, she, she agrees with the spiritualists that there is a spiritual realm that we can be in communication with where she disagrees is the idea that the spirits are deceased. Um, unlike the Fox sisters who commune with the dead, Blavatsky communes with higher powers, with, with what she calls the master spirits, um, which are, are entities in a spiritual realm that are trying to influence the physical realm and shape our lives and, sh and shape our future. Um, this all coalesces in a philosophy called theosophy. And that takes off like wildfire. Um, one thing to note as we continue is that I am going to speak in, about theosophy in very general terms. That is because I do not understand all of the many manifestations and uh, sort of belief systems of theosophy. Theosophy itself has evolved over the, the time uh, since, since Blavatsky founded it in the 1870s. But also um, I think the reason that it is sometimes hard to grasp all of the elements of it is because it is intentionally complex. In the 19th century, we see um, many new religions form in the United States and in Europe. Um, and these new religious systems, I think, are, are um, often specifically intended to be complicated because there is this, uh, there is sort of this connection between complication and authenticity. We think about ancient religions, we think about, about um, about, uh, we think about Judaism, we think about Islam, we think about uh, uh, Catholicism and certainly early Christianity are very ritualistic um, and, um, and sort of practice heavy religions. And so I think there is this drive on the part of creators of new religions to, to connect back to that by making their faith systems pretty complex. Um, so I am not a theosophy expert. I do not understand the ins and outs of this belief system. Um, uh, and so I, I just want to put my cards on the table. Uh, also, researching is very much a, 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 um, a black hole of, of, or a rabbit hole, I should say, where one thing leads you to something else. And the next thing you know, you're on some occult website uh, run by a webmaster built in 1995. So um, it's a journey. But um, uh, there is definitely a very rich uh, ecosystem of thinking around theosophy. Um, and, uh, and, and it is ultimately about this connection with the spiritual realm and the meeting of East and West. And so it has this sort of uh, pan-religious belief system as well that we can be absorbing elements of Christianity, um, uh, of Buddhism, um, of various different belief systems and sort of combining them into a, um, a new system for a new world. Next slide, please. Um, so Blavatsky, to get, to get back to, to the Madame, she is uh, in New York um, and she begins traveling both nationally and abroad, sort of promoting this, this worldview. She publishes multiple magazines. These are just two of them. On the left is Lucifer. This is the first issue of Lucifer, the Lightbringer, Theos Theosophical Monthly. This was published with Mabel Collins. One thing, again, you'll note that a lot of the names that show up in this are women. Um, which is again that connection to to um, the occult and spiritualism as a as a space for 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 women to assert themselves. Um, on the right is the Theosophist. Um, uh, these are both from the Theosophical Research Library in Australia, and it's also really important to note that this does become a global movement. Um, uh, uh, the the the, um, uh, the Australian Theosophist. Um, is actually also, there's a connection to the Indian off the office in India. Um, uh, and um, the, there are connections between uh, from Europe to, the, to New York, the Osophists going back and forth. So it really is this kind of global um, uh, community. Um, can next slide, please? So uh, uh, like I said, it's global, it's, it's transcontinental. Um, uh, this is a, uh, a really beautiful set of um, an example of that sort of intermingling of spiritual belief and an object. Um, on uh, the left is an image from Loma Land. Uh, Loma Land was a theosophical community um, established by a woman, Catherine Tipley, 
Gonzalez, I believe her name, um, in San Diego, California um, at the turn of the century. And uh, this is a gathering of members of the community. And you can see that behind the speaker is um, this beautiful carved um, uh, a screen and then on either sides are, are, are the dais is flanked by chairs. One of those chairs is actually on the left or on the right rather. Um, uh, and uh, it was carved along with everything else that's carved in that photo by Reginald Michelle, who was a British um, thinker, writer, artist, craftsman, painter, um, really a spiritual searcher who becomes involved in theosophy in, in England and sort of goes on a journey following various theosophical thinkers um, until he ends up in Loma Land where he spends most of his, the rest of his life um, producing art and objects for the community. So, so there, there are photographs of the, of, of the community and at every single photo you can, you can just sort of, if you zoom in, you can spot a carved object by Michelle. Um, and um, this chair, I think, really captures the mix of aesthetics that come into play in this belief system. Uh, you have what I would describe as more of a, of a Celtic knot on the skirt of the chair underneath the seat. Um, uh, but then you also have sort of more Indian inspired um, uh, kind of um, frond or feather patterns. And so there is, again, this real, this real melding of the aesthetics and melding of belief systems. Go to the next slide. Um, again, it's global. So we also find theosophical, like major theosophical communities in Europe, in particular the Netherlands. Um, uh, on the left is the Ideal Multi-Sided Contemplation, uh, which is a book about the contemplation and meditative practices of theosophy. Um, and on the right is the Proof for the uh, Theos Theosophia, um, which is the magazine um, for the, 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 the Dutch uh, theosophical um, community. And so um, these are, again, these ornate decorated objects that um, capture much of the symbology of, of theosophy. You have the interlocking circles, you have um, the interlocking triangles that form, um, that, 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 that both form and are not quite a, 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 a Magen David, a Star of David, which also seems very intentional, the borrowing of this motif. Um, uh, you have the lotus flower, uh, which is again, re referencing the East. Um, and the cross. So kind of these mixing of symbols um, from different places and from different, from different faiths. Um, and uh, 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 there's a great deal of, of, of art produced associated with um, theosophy that is not just, um, it, you know, decorative for the for the for printing on books and on book covers or for use in a theosophical chamber. Um, on the left is a, a painting by the artist Melchior Lecter, who's a, a German artist, um, but who's who's working in the Netherlands often, um, uh, and he is. Um, uh, referencing the, the text is actually, the name of the painting is uh, Diane Choam, um, and that's a Sanskrit term, Sanskrit term. So again, we are, we are, we are borrowing from, from, other, from other countries and from other faith systems um, to create a sort of vision of a unified spiritual world. Next slide. We're going to, okay, this is going to feel very different. We're taking a bit of a turn, but I promise it connects. Um, in uh, 2018, I had the opportunity to see the exhibition um, Hilma Ach Klint, Paintings for the Future, which was um, on view at the Guggenheim Museum. Um, it ran from 2018 to 2019. It's, I think, the last exhibition I saw outside of our museum before the pandemic hit. Um, and it is uh, just beautiful. Um, and um, uh, Helma of Klint is a fascinating figure. She uh, is uh, Swedish, um, uh, born in the uh, middle of the 19th century, dies, uh, no, sorry, the second, the last quarter of the 19th century dies in the 1960s. And um, she, from an early age, is a spiritual searcher and she finds herself in a theosophical community quite young. Um, she actually connects with four other women and they, they form a group called the Five and they are uh, theosophists and they commit themselves to communing with spirits. Um, and seeing themselves as mediums for spirits, not as, not as active agents themselves in their lives, but as vessels for the spirits to, to speak through. Um, and that's really how she approaches her art for many years. Um, she begins painting uh, a series of paintings in 1907 that completes them in 1915 that are um, her paintings 
paintings for the temple. Um, and she believes that this spirit has spoken through her and has told her to paint these paintings for the temple. She does not know what the temple is. Um, but she must paint them. Um, and uh, we see in her work uh, symbols that are not necessarily translatable to us, as certainly not to me as someone who is not a theosophist, but um, are clearly important to her. They repeat again and again. And there are diagrams in her work, whether or not we can read them, they are clearly diagrammatic. And um, what is so compelling about uh, her work is also the thing that is kind of tragic about it. Um, she never achieves much fame outside of theosophical communities. She exhibits her work really only in small theosophical and um, uh, she also ends up working a little bit with Rudolf Steiner. Um, uh, so really in small, in small gatherings and um, when she dies in her will, she says that her art cannot be viewed for tw for at least twenty years after she died. So things, so so her art does not come back into into view until the nineteen nineties, basically, and it takes yet another you know twenty years for it to make it to the Guggenheim, where she is clearly understood as a as a uh, like you know a modernist before modernism. She's you know she's before Kandinsky. She's she's before these sort of great male uh, uh, modernist painters who are who are looking at color and symbol in an abstract way. Um, so Hilma af Klint, theosophist. Next slide, please. So uh, on the left is one of these major paintings um, for the paintings for the temple series. This is group X, uh, group 10, uh, number one, it's an altar piece. Uh, again, there's no temple, um, there's no actual temple. This and, and what the structure of the temple was, was unknown even to, to Hilma. Um, but you can see that again, there are, there's this diagrammatic quality and there are very clear symbols. There's the triangle with the gradated steps, almost like a pyramid and, and a path upwards. And there is a, a circle, perhaps a sun. On the right is a work by um, Olga Froba Captain. Uh, it's called The Central Spiritual Sun. And it is one of uh, 14, uh, prints made from a series of paintings that were called her meditation, who were, that were called her meditation paintings or her meditation drawings. Olga was not an artist. Unlike Hilma, Olga did not see herself as an artist. She, she saw herself as a scholar, as a scientist, um, and as a theosophist. Those were her sort of belief systems. Um, and for her, the meditation drawings, these were drawings that she and paintings that she produced in a meditative state, were an opportunity to exercise her beliefs um, and to get out images that she felt to her were more communicative than words. Um, but it is really clear to me that there is a shared visual language here. Now, I don't know if Olga and Hilma knew each other. They certainly overlap in time period. Uh, Hilma is in Sweden, Olga tra is Dutch, but eventually settles in Switzerland and is a world traveler. Um, so it is certainly possible that they might have encountered each other at theosophical meetings um, and Hilma and Olga could have seen Hilma's paintings. Um, but given how private Hilma was about her art, I think it's very possible that they didn't actually, that, you know, Olga never, never saw the paintings. I don't know, I can't confirm, but um, uh, the meditation plates were exhibited in our Pursuit of Abstraction exhibition. And when I started doing research on this project um, and came across these prints, I immediately thought of Hilma's painting. Um, and so it's really clear to me that these are two women who are using their art to express or their creative impulses to express a symbolist language that speaks to their spiritual beliefs, even if we can't understand what those beliefs are, um, even if that's sort of been lost in translation, there is a really clear language and a clear communicative quality to these works. Um, uh, and I think that's that's really wonderful. Next slide, please. Um, Olga, like I said, was not was did not see herself as an artist. Um, she was actually best known for founding an organization called the Aranos Foundation, which is still in operation, um, and it is a conference center in Switzerland. And the idea in her pro on her property, and her idea was really to bring together. She described it as bringing together the spirituality of East and West, sort of the ultimate manifestation of a theosophical principle. Um, and they hold sessions with thinkers from around the world who explore human spirituality and its different manifestations. Um, again, this is one another one of these pairs um, where I really like uh, I was I was telling Isabel that when I was looking at these, I had this moment where I started wondering if I was becoming, you know, there's this sort of like, am I investing too much into the into the relationship between these works? Am I getting sort of sucked into a theosophical spiral of like there are symbols everywhere? 
Um, but I, I do think again that there is a relationship, you know, the one the work on the left, um, uh, sorry, the work on the, uh, on the right is the central, um, oh, is the, the, uh, the heart and the chalice and the work on the right is the tree of knowledge. Um, but in both works, you see um, this chalice figure in the, in the, on the left, it's in the center, on the right, it's um, at the very top, there's a chalice, and then the, the kind of the flaming heart motif, and then these circular levels in Hilma's watercolor, um, which denote the, the sort of the realms of the spirits um, in the tree of knowledge. If you put them on, if you sort of look at them from above, they form the interlocking circles around the heart um, on, on Olga's print. Uh, and so there's this relationship uh, that, you know, I can't articulate exactly what it is because I am not in tune with what they were thinking, but um, even though they are stylistically so different, separated by time period, by nation, um, uh, they're engaging with the same ideas and with the same spirits. Thank you, Shoshana. That's brilliant. And um, I, I don't think you're uh, seeing signs. I, I, I do think that there is a, a really interesting connection there. And it, it's kind of eerier, made eerier rather, by the fact that they perhaps might not have known each other. So I wonder what they were in tune with. That's fascinating. Um, so we're going to move um, from there to another, a, a smaller belief system, much smaller, um, but and a little closer to home too. Um, so we're going to talk about the, the Koresh. Um, in particular, we're going to start with um, Cyrus T, or uh, who turns changes his name to Koresh, um, and where you get Koresh Natty um, and the Koreshan. So um, interestingly enough, that, uh, it is a small, um, religion or cult started in New York. So talking about that uh, burnt over uh, section, um, it starts there with Cyrus. Um, Cyrus starts out as a uh, doctor. Interestingly enough, the medical school that he went to is um, in his lifetime actually uh, shut down and, and condemned as uh, being a school for quacks. Uh, so interestingly enough, um, he is in his uh, lab, he is conducting some sort of pseudoscience experiments, that being kind of the theme for the, one of the themes for the evening. Um, when something goes awry and there's an explosion, he is knocked unconscious. And this is a moment that he calls, um, later on he would call the divine illumination. So um, in this unconscious state, he claims that an angel came and visited him and let him, let him know that he is the next messiah. So um, Cyrus T changes his name to Koresh, um, and begins a, a group with uh, a few really interesting beliefs for the time period being. So um, we're thinking these, there are about four main tenets here. Uh, one being that women are inherently equal. So what's really interesting is um, we go from New York, uh, Cyrus then goes to, or Koresh then goes to Chicago and eventually settles in Estero, Florida over on the Southwest, um, right beneath uh, Naples and above Fort Myers. Um, and you can actually still visit this site. It's now a beautiful state park, um, but that's more towards the end of our story. But when he moves down to, to Florida, because of this belief, um, he moves down with 200 different visit um, followers, 75%, so about 150 of them being women, which is really interesting. Um, he believed women are equal. Um, and then the other tenements of his belief are, the second is uh, celibacy. So um, true believers, there are three levels of belief for the Koresh, and the highest level um, were beings that were completely celibate. Um, and then interestingly enough, the third uh, belief here has to do with cellular cosmogony. Um, it's this book that was published, um, and you'll see here there's a very abbreviated caption because it is a recent acquisition into our collection. We're quite excited about it. Um, and you may be asking, what is cellular cosmogony? Well, I will show you in this next slide. So uh, what really sets them apart is the belief that the earth is in fact a sphere, but it, it's actually a hollow sphere. It's an orb and we live inside it. Um, so this is kind of riding on the coattails of um, a lot of thought that's happening in the 19th century where we establish that the earth is an orb, right? But if it's an orb, then what's inside it, right? So there are all these romantic um, ideas and stories um, joining to the center of the earth about what is inside this orb. So uh, Cyrus Teed uh, proposed that the entire universe is inside the uh, what we call the Earth. Um, and you'll see here on the left, 
apologies that this one doesn't have a caption. This is actually a photo taken from the um, state park website. Um, and it, you can actually go to the state park and see this, uh, this electronic model in action. Um, so you'll see here that the continents and the oceans are on the inside of the orb, which is really interesting. So they believed that all of um, earth or all of life was here on the inside in the shell of the orb. And then the inside contains the cosmos. So what you're looking at um, when you're looking at stars, they're actually uh, imperfections in how light is being reflected and that the sun is um, powered by some sort of cosmic battery, right? So um, the cellular cosmogony here on the right, this is an actual uh, poorly blown up image because again, it hasn't been digitized. It's, it's that recent um, of, uh, of the model. And then here's the model over on the left in, in real life. So what's really interesting is you've got these beliefs happening. Um, and then the fourth belief, which some people credit as being their, uh, their downfall, but, but isn't, um, is the fact that, uh, or rather is, is that Cyrus is uh, immortal. So uh, 1890, uh, 1894 is when uh, Koresh and his followers come down. They buy 320 acres of land um, and they in it takes about nine years to clear all this land to build buildings. Um, but pretty soon they're able to sustain themselves um, in the height in the early 1900s. They have about 7000 acres of land and multiple businesses, including a bakery. Um, they have buildings. They're, they're really self-sustaining. Um, and they're actually able to incorporate the, uh, the community of Estero. So uh, on the height of all of the success, unfortunately, tragedy strikes. And in 1908, Cyrus Teed dies, uh, disproving that fourth tenement that he is immortal. Um, his followers wait around for about five days, hoping that he will, in fact, uh, reincarnate or in, um, come back to life. And unfortunately, that, that doesn't happen. He does not resurrect um, and he is buried. And that ends up being kind of the... the um, the turning point, or in, there's a sharp decline afterwards for the organization. Um, some people like to credit the decline with one of their other, with their belief of, of celibacy, right? So if you were a leader in this organization, in this community, um, you had to take a vow of celibacy. Marriage was uh, was not permitted. If you were on the outsides of the community, you could marry, um, but you could only uh, you could only engage in in sexual relations for the the uh, for progeny's sake, right? So only to reproduce and to have a family, but, but that's about it. Um, but in fact, what, what is credited looking back now with their downfall is um, Mr. Uh, T's demise. And so it's, it's a really interesting idea and group that kind of brings home um, the idea of, of how do we explore this other realm, right? So what does it mean to um, navigate the worldly realm and how do you then prepare yourself as best you can for the um, for whatever lies beyond. Um, and this is also seen in the fact that uh, Koresh was seen as the seventh prophet. So there's similar to um, theosophy, there's this meshing of different religions and ideas. Um, so the uh, Koresh belief system was really a meshing of um, Old Testament, New Testament, um, and then the beyond. So they were really seen as the future with um, Jesus being the sixth prophet, prophet and Koresh being the seventh, which is fascinating. Um, and I will now turn it over to Shoshana to tell us about another cult with perhaps less uh, altruistic uh, uh, motivations. Yes, we are gonna finish our journey through uh, the spiritual realm, the charismatic cult, uh, with a cult that was certainly charismatic um, uh, and also ran afoul of the law, uh, as many cults eventually do with the successful ones. Um, and uh, uh, I want to I want to finish with this couple, um, uh, Guy and Edna Ballard, uh, here photographed in Chicago, Illinois. Um, uh, in uh, the 1920s, Guy Ballard, uh, who was a, a salesman, was on a hike in uh, on on. Um, uh, in California and um, Mount Shasta, and claimed that when he reached the peak, he had a, was um, visited by the spirit of Saint Germain. Interestingly, Saint Germain is a is a is one of the many master spirits in Theosophy. Always comes back to Madame Blavatsky, <laughs> um, and uh, and this Theosophical spirit spoke to Guy 
um, and told him that he was not Guy Ballard, he was in fact Godfrey Ray King, um, and that he uh, um, had a kind of spiritual knowledge of the world and could spread his message across the country. And so that is what he and his wife, Edna, who became Lotus Ray King, did. They formed the I Am Activity or the I Am Group. Um, uh, it, the name comes from I Am What I Am, which is a translation of a, of a, of a, um, of a, um, I think, I believe a Tibetan phrase. Um, and, um, and they begin selling books, um, sheet music, if we go to the next slide, um, that are all about um, uh, the kind of message of love that, that, the, that the, um, the kings, that Godfrey Ray and Lotus Ray King are able to share. And they, in fact, describe donations to their church as love gifts. Um, that by giving you, by giving them your money, you will receive their love in return. They will think positive thoughts for you, and they were very interested in the idea of sort of psychic powers. Um, that and this is what they preached: that people who have elevated to a certain level of belief have psychic powers. Um, they were also virulently um, anti-immigrant. Um, and um, uh, traded in other pretty um, abhorrent ideologies, um, racism, anti-Semitism. Uh, they were nativists in just about every way. And so um, at various points, their sort of psychic powers were used, they argued, to, um, to, send, to send a psychic assassination attempt to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, during the height of the New Deal. Um, so they were kind of marrying their, uh, their their belief system and their kind of cult following with, with extreme political uh, beliefs. This all catches up to them in 1939 uh, when the IRS comes after them for tax evasion. Um, they are um, not a registered religion um, and they are not paying taxes on the, on the millions of dollars that they are raking in through this, through this belief system, through this cult. Um, and uh, uh, Sadly, and or suspiciously, depending on who you believe, um, before they can go to court, um, uh, Godfrey Ray King, um, uh, uh, Guy Ballard, passes away. If we go to the next slide. And so these last two images are, uh, are sheet music. So they would sell, like I said, they sold books, but they also sold a great deal of sheet music. They were a very musical cult. Um, very much actually in the, in the, um, you, in that first photo of them, you can see how glamorous they look, and certainly Guy in his in his white tuxedo. There was a real association with Hollywood, with um, with kind of Los Angeles glamour um, in their self presentation. Those love gifts bought them very beautiful clothes, um, and so the sheet music is all tied up in that as well as sort of um, 1930s glitzy glamour version of a cult. And uh, the Godfrey, our loved one, ascended was the is the sheet music on the left, um, which was. Um, uh, written in his memory after his death. And Nada, our love, Nada was one of these spirits that, that they communed with. Um, so the, the cult sort of falls apart uh, following the, the IRS um, uh, lawsuit and, and the loss of a great deal of their money. They, uh, they move out, the remaining members um, follow Lotus Ray King and her son, Donald, really prosaic name, um, uh, to, I believe, New Mexico, where they try to restart it, but they just can't catch that, that same spark that they had with Godfrey in the 1930s. Um, and I think, you know, with this sort of final story of like what seems to be pure chicanery, um, there is this really interesting, uh, I think, um, thread, which is this desire to engage with a spiritual world that, that extends beyond the physical realm, and also the fact that these these things, these movements gain popularity at moments of great questioning and distrust and anxiety. We think about um, the Fox sisters in the 1850s um, with the rise of anxiety around, um, around the pending civil war, uh, around abolition, around women's rights. Um, certainly uh, Madame Blavatsky arriving in 1875 and by the 1880s, the United States is embroiled in a full scale um, economic depression. Um, uh, we think about the, the Ballards in the 1930s um, with the, the, the um, threat of looming threat of war from Europe, uh, the Great Depression. These are all moments where people want answers and the world as it is does not provide them answers that, are, that can explain enough of what they are experiencing. And so they seek, seek out answers elsewhere. Um, so 
I think that sort of rounds up my feeling about this, this, this whole research process, this, these many rabbit holes Isabel and I have been down. Um, uh, and uh, it's been a fascinating wild ride. And there's much like with Theosophy, there's so much more to explore. Absolutely, very well put, Shoshana, thank you. Thank you for that. Brilliant, um, Shoshana, Isabel, thank you for being our mediums this evening. Thank you for, for being that conduit um, and sharing these insights um, that these objects hold within. I think we're really able to tap into their frequency, um, perhaps many insights that would have been lost in just a casual observation and engagement. Um, I'm particularly struck by just the way this program developed as well, originally envisioned as a walking tour of the museum, which can obviously stay to, still take place, but in this other format, we were able to kind of just venture with much greater um, depth and nuance um, into the selection. So let's let's take a look at some of the questions we received. Um, we have a question from Jean. Was there a relationship between Cyrus T. Koresh and David Koresh of the Branch Davidians? That is a great question. Um, and I don't know the answer. I we'll go out on a limb. I would have to do some more research just to be 100% certain, but I think because Cyrus uh, changed his name to Crash, I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I think they're too separate. I don't think there's a family relation there, but I would have to double check. So that's an excellent question. Well, and Crash also changed his name, um, uh, but, uh, you know, I think in both cases, they are referencing, um, kind of bibli biblical figures, uh, uh, Koresh is, uh, and sort of ancient figures, Koresh is the Hebrew of Cyrus. Um, so Cyrus the Great, there is this kind of association with ancient power um, through their names. Uh, yes, Aaron Weston just said, Koresh is supposed to be the Persian version of Cyrus, exactly. Um, and so uh, I think that they were perhaps both drawn to the same sort of sense of self-presentation, um, but any actual, you know, if David Koresh was familiar with the Koreshans and, and researched them, I don't know, it's a great question. Feels like that's a dissertation topic. <laughs> <laughs> We also have a great comment from Mark, who, who's here with us this evening, um, noting the Koresh State Park near Fort Myers. And so that's another great kind of place to check out to really delve into the history of the Koresh Unity Settlement and their architecture the, in the buildings they left behind. So for anyone kind of a little more curious, the Koresh State Park is the place to look into. Um, but yes, I think for me, this was a, of an expansive, broad survey. Um, that, you know, we can spend so much time just kind of digging into, but um, instead of like maybe just reflect slightly on in the process itself, this intuitive kind of um, exploration. Um, Shoshana, you mentioned just um, Hilma F. Clint kind of materializing, um, seeing that parallel, so that lingering kind of memory from the last in-person ex uh, exhibition experience um, and just seeing that kind of uh, at play. Um, so I don't know if there's any additional remarks with, with regards to, again, intuition and well, I, shaping this talk itself. I, I don't, I mean, as someone who is deeply unintuitive, uh, this whole process researching this has been very fascinating um, and seeing people who are sort of driven by their, their intuition and sort of their willingness to let go and, and produce what they produce in the case of Hilma and, and Olga. Um, so I think there is this like very, um, there's sort of a surrender that is implicit in that, that I find very compelling and powerful, even if it does not match the way I live my life. Um, uh, uh, and um, I do also want to note, Aaron makes a really great point um, in the in the chat that um, the, the foundational beliefs of theosophy are really um, sort of key to many new age religious groups. And I think that, that that's absolutely correct. These are belief systems that sort of uh, re reappear and reappear again at interesting moments, right? We think of new age belief systems as emerging um, in the 60s and the 70s, yet another time of great unrest. Um, and so, so there is this kind of cyclical nature. And I also wanted to note, Jean Rosenberg noted that um, there was a recent book about Cyrus Teed, and there is a great deal of scholarship on these subjects. Isabel and I have only scraped the surface, certainly the surface in the collection, but, you know, perhaps more importantly, kind of the larger scholarly circus. And I, I should have mentioned this, there's also a wonderful book um, called Radical Spirit, which is about the relationship between spiritualism and uh, women's rights in the 19th century um, by Anne uh, uh, 
Burn, I believe. Um, uh, and so it was published in 1989, but it's been re-released a couple of times and it's, it's really good. So there's a wonderful, there's like, there's more to plumb both in the art and in the scholarship and in the experiential quality of this material. Absolutely. It's been an amazing journey to look at our collection um, and come a bit of a roller coaster ride. And I, I think you make an excellent point, Shoshana, about um, seeing someone really let go and stick to their to their beliefs, however far-fetched they may seem to, to the mainstream, um, was really um, was a really inspiring moment, despite it not it being my exact speed. Absolutely. Well, Shoshana, Isabel, thank you again for the insights and reflections shared this evening. Um, I invite everyone to take a look outside. Our full moon is happening. And so make sure you, you experience that yourselves and, and set the intention for this next cycle. Um, with that, again, thank you for joining us and stay tuned to our calendar for upcoming programs. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.